Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people, people who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond, people who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hogue, and I'm delighted to have as our guest today an individual who's been in the business community. He's developed a number of, of healthcare uh, products. He has developed uh, an overdose uh, intervention app. He uh, has authored a number of articles in such diverse uh, areas as climate change, uh, genetics, and healthcare. He is a director and has been a director of the Surrey Crime Prevention Society. Uh, he hosts a number of projects working with, with youths and utilizing sport development as one of the areas that help us to get engaged in our community and understand ourselves a little better. And he's on the board of directors of Diver Diverse City Diver City, which helps newcomers uh, to build the life that they want to have in Canada. So I'm so delighted to welcome a very engaged and engaging person who's got such a diverse number of things he's interested in, cares about. Welcome, Upkar Tatley. Gordon, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to have you. So can you tell us uh, and uh, all of our listeners and watchers uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got engaged in these things and if there was something about your upbringing maybe led you into this type of lifestyle. Well, absolutely. Yeah, no, you, you, that was a great introduction, by the way. Um, it's kind of a contemporary what I'm doing these days, but uh, there's always an origin story, I guess. So um, mine, uh, I guess, like many people, uh, it started in the interior uh, in a mining town. Uh, I come from a mining family. My grandfather was the first one to come to Canada. He, uh, he had fought in the Second World War, and he was part of that first wave of folks who uh, arrived in Canada after the war. And um, I was born in Merritt, and then from Merritt, we um, moved around a little bit uh, as, as families who were tied to, I guess, the resource sector tend to do. My father was also a heavy duty mechanic, um, and we moved to the Kootenays. We, uh, you know, we, saw the, we saw Nelson Trail, uh, Castlegar. And so we, yeah, we did, we did the whole, a uh, little bit of the interior circuit. And it was really the foundational experiences I had there that ultimately led to the work I, I do now. I think it's still, I just was talking to somebody the other day, it informs heavily um, the thought behind or the passion behind some of the projects that we're involved in today. Um, but yeah, no, that, that led to uh, obviously, well, hopefully I finished high school. And then um, you and my shared alma mater, uh, UVic. So I did my undergraduate there and um, quite a few interesting experiences. I was, uh, I was an RA resident advisor for a long time there throughout my experience in university. But then I did my postgrad uh, at UBC and I'm still tied to that institution in that we do uh, significant projects at UBC. I was working at Michael Smith for a, lab, uh, for a long time. It's a laboratory there. Um, but it was the uh, experiences I had that were interspersed throughout my academic career that were I think perhaps more contributing to like I mentioned just like my upbringing was so was the experiences I had as an intern um, uh, when I was doing practicums and things like that so it's uh, you know I was I was working down in Arizona doing repatriation of um, uh, what we would call First Nations Indigenous people they do still call Indian uh, uh, communities so that's we were doing repatriation of uh, uh, ancient, very ancient uh, grave sites. Uh, and then later on, I ended up in um, Washington, D.C. And I missed, uh, unfortunately, the timing was poor. So I was down there during 9-11. Um, so that was an experience into itself. And then, um, yeah, and then, you know, I've, it's uh, over probably closer to 13 years now uh, as a Surrey person, but uh, South Surrey, White Rock. So that's kind of that's kind of where I operate from these days. Uh, this is home for us, especially during uh, COVID, as many families are experiencing. Home is definitely where you spend all your time. So, 
So do you, do you think there are some, uh, some incidents or people that were role models as you were growing up that led you to the, the kind of engaging uh, lifestyle you have now and the commitment to give so much to your community? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's interesting. You do, you know, in the path of life, like everybody else, you, you encounter folks that um, have an influence on you. And um, it could be a negative influence or a positive one. And, uh, you know, sometimes you will see folks that you think, yeah, I'm going to do things a little bit differently than they do. So I did grow up, um, it was a little bit difficult, uh, you know, coming from smaller towns and um, being a person of a certain ethnicity and being one of the only ones. And uh, you know, there were some inherent challenges with that, but it does teach you quite a bit. And it teaches you a lot in a short period of time that some people never learn or if they learn they over. They, t they have the luxury of learning over a long uh, protracted period of time. I didn't get that luxury. It was kind of, you know, um, stick to your ground and, 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 and learn real quick. So I think those experiences definitely um, taught me a few lessons uh, and I still carry them forward today. Um, but throughout that, there were key individuals that um, were really, you know, I can still see flashes of them here and there that, you know, would take your hand and just guide you with a real, um, it's, a, it's a tough thing to describe, but I would say common sense uh, attitude. And I, I remember I had a principal, and um, this is probably when basketball really took a hold of me too. It was that, you know, he, he was the high school principal, but he would just open the gym doors on evenings and weekends, and he was there and he was playing with us. He was on the court and he was running with, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old guys that were running him out of the gym, but he was there all the time. And um, the camaraderie with him, his willingness to just sit on the sidelines and talk to you during a break. Um, yeah, I, I really do find that that resonated with me. And I think and I hope that I do honor to that individual in, in some of the coaching that we do. So, um, you know, we've been running programming now for over over a decade as well. You know, we started our, our nonprofit. When I say nonprofit, it's a nonprofit in a very extreme sense. We, we don't have funding. We're just out there getting the work done. Um, and it just started innocently enough as a basketball program. It was quick. It was easy. I mean, you need a hoop, you need a basketball. And uh, hopefully a coach who knows what he's doing. And um, yeah, you know, we, and it was a good and bad thing because you know, the first time when we opened our doors, we had, we were busting at the seams because we were a free program. And it, that's a good feeling that you're able to address the need that the community has. But at the same time, it kind of felt like, man, I you know, really wish we didn't have this kind of a program like ours wasn't necessary. Uh, just showed, demonstrated outwardly what the needs are. And so the program evolved and grew and we, um, you know, we added things because, you know, oftentimes communities need one thing. It's just an indicator of so many other needs that are uh, longstanding. So, uh, you know, we added mentorship. Uh, we added academic help, tutoring. Um, but now that program's, uh, that nonprofit has evolved so much. It's, it's youth focused, but we're addressing vulnerable communities, at-risk communities. We help uh, with homelessness. Uh, we do... Uh, hygiene kits for homeless folks. We, you know, we get them out into the right hands where they're needed most. Um, one of the biggest projects we have ongoing is food security. And we've been doing that for our region here in South Surrey, White Rock, but we've been doing it throughout from uh, throughout the south of the Fraser region. And we've been providing food and uh, upwards to about 2,500 people during the peak of COVID, which I, I don't know if it really was the peak, but Colloquially, I would say it was around late April, May for us. That, that's when we found that the need was just immense. Um, and one of the newest things I'm really passionate and excited about is we've been doing, um, uh, and it kind of fits into the hygiene spectrum, we've been doing haircuts for homeless folks. And that program's slowly evolving. So we work with local ERC sites to get out there um, and provide basic hygiene supplies and then also offer them haircuts as well. So. It's just a all-encompassing program. Uh, it's called Engage Communities Canada. And um, it's, you know, like I said before about the basketball, it's one of those things where you 
feel proud about the work. You're, you're glad it's out there and it's filling a need, but you also it's with a bit of grain. Of, it's with a grain of salt because you realize the needs are so huge that your, a program like yours is necessary. You've done some work with respect to opioids as well. Could you talk about yeah. the challenges and demands with that and uh, how you're seeing and manage that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the work I do on the professional side, you know, the things that keep the lights on and pay the bills, and um, I often try to couple uh, the work that we do, the R&D projects that we launch, um, with things that I may have an insight on, um, either anecdotally, socially, uh, within the community context, or that other members of our team do. Uh, when it comes to overdose, I was already working on some issues. Um, now I'll backtrack a bit. I used to be a firefighter and first responder. Um, and that's probably the first time I noticed that the demographics of individuals who were presenting overdose or symptoms of an overdose were very different from what perhaps the stereotype notion is. And, and that includes myself too. I, you know, I, I came equipped with a stereotype of who perhaps suffers from drug use uh, or, or is dealing with the challenges of drug use. Um, and that tends to be downtown east side and Wally, primarily Caucasian, perhaps urban indigenous, and that's it. it you know, it doesn't affect other communities. Um, I was shaken from that reality as a first responder when I started to see people of other ethnicities and demographics. Uh, a young South Asian female was the first time that I witnessed an overdose. So it really shook me then. Um, but then coupled with that was the anecdotal experience I had had started to develop by by coaching families and kids. And a lot of those families start to come forward and say, look, can you be mindful of our child this week? Um, he or she just lost their father. And that happened once, it happened twice, it happened multiple times a week. And that started to happen at such a high clip that you could not help but think there had to be something going on. And uh, a lot of those communities that were coming up and having these conversations with myself were um, members of um, the BIPOC community. They were uh, Syrian members, they were South Asian, uh, some Sudanese, uh, urban indigenous as well. So I had started to understand that there was some anecdotal evidence and perhaps there was some work to be done on this uh, crisis. So luckily for me, I was doing some work with one of the health authorities, interpreting data, uh, helping them out, uh, helping the epidemiology teams interpret data as to who exactly is dying. And that's when all this information, both as a first responder and anecdotally as, as, a, um, as an executive director of a nonprofit, it all co coalesced with the data. And that's when the true picture emerged, exactly who is being impacted. And not only were these communities impacted, but they were overly impacted. And that's what was seen. Um, that took a while to get that research and report published. In fact, it was only published in the Chief Medical Health Officer's report earlier this year. Uh, I believe in June. So we didn't really have, I know personally, I didn't have the luxury of waiting a few years to have this data presented because good data often leads to good work and not necessarily myself, but there's so many uh, individuals in the community and organizations that can do excellent, excellent execution of good projects with great data. So um, not wanting to sit and wait because ultimately these are our community members who were dying um, I pushed out two projects and um, one was community based and grassroots based and it's called the salmon project. The intention of that project was to um, break barriers of conversation and stigma around overdose. So start introducing people to the conversation that at a very basic level for many communities. It's, it's a brand new thing. Um, and then at the same time, equipping them with harm reduction techniques, um, any other resources from local health authorities that they perhaps are unaware of. Um, but I did, I felt like that wasn't enough. So at work at Oxus Machine Works, we started to develop a digital platform. And uh, it was a three pronged approach. It was the website, social media, of course, but also with a digital app that we were able to put into people's hands to ensure that they were, um, they knew what to do in the event of an overdose. And we had done immense amounts of data polls and conversations with community members. And that really indicated to us a few things. Number one, that they felt like they wanted something. They wanted a solution. They did not want 
the users to continue to uh, be allocated certain resources. And that would that that and I'll explain that because what's been happening for many many years is someone who's consuming or partaking in the consumption of uh, opioids or any kind of substances. Um, we will often direct our resources to them and only them. And what that does on a social level, it, it kind of parks the entire challenge on that one community. You're no longer um, making it a, 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 a community problem. You're making an isolated, siloed problem. So one thing we decided to do was we intentionally made this technology, although a user could use it, um, we made it widespread. We want to, the entire community to be engaged in responding to this crisis. So we started to work away at this to make it user friendly for all ages, multiple communities, and purposely intending it so that, you know, if you've never used drugs or you, you strongly feel like it doesn't exist in your community or your family, you should still have this on your phone. So it's a no barrier product. It's free uh, on multiple platforms, Google and Apple. Uh, it's very user friendly. But the intention is that at some point you may encounter an overdose and the likelihood given the statistics we've seen here in Canada and North America, the chances are pretty high. And so we, um, yeah, we rolled that out um, and the timing could, unfortunately I have to say that it could not have been better because um, I think we're pretty well aware what the staggering numbers of overdoses are right now and they just continue to mount. Um, the numbers are horrific. Um, there's very little that we can do that has been done in terms of stemming those numbers because unfortunately it's right in the middle of a, a global pandemic. Uh, I think the response both at the federal level and our province has been not only just but has been done really, really well. So it's take, but it takes a lot of resources to respond in the way that Canada has to uh, COVID. And so I'm hoping now that, um, you know, it was just this morning, I believe they announced the vaccine. So thankfully, um, that means that they'll be able to perhaps turn their attention towards this crisis, the overdose crisis that we're experiencing. And one of the things that uh, your narrative is, is uh, revealing again is that the media seems to think that it's downtown, downtown east side. And I think the statistics are somewhere over 60% of people who are dying of overdoses are dying at home and are members of families. And I think that's uh, an important intervention that you're talking about that uh, is not well known within the context of our communities. Yeah, yeah. it's not to say that folks don't continue to uh, in those areas, downtown east side, Maple Ridge, there's parts of Maple Ridge that are you know seeing high rates as well. Uh, Wally continues to, it's not to say that those places do not no longer is it there it is occurring there but there has been for a long time a neglected demographic that has been experiencing overdosing in high high numbers and um you know part of the challenge has been as you're saying is is making sure that community and media is aware of those things and so we can bring you know aware from awareness comes you know action and ultimately hope the hope is that that comes to a positive resolution um, so how, I do find that the majority of my time, in addition to the innovation technology side, um, is just informing people, is just is, is working with government, is, 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 you know, helping people understand the data and the information that's being presented. Um, that's, that's probably 70% of the work I do. So based on your experience and knowledge, uh, where do you see the the future of us going with this. We've got the injection sites. We see that uh, Oregon has recently uh, passed uh, or decriminalized uh, the use of a uh, number of drugs. And we, we look at the experience in Portugal, which has been seen as they've shifted a number of their, their uh, interventions from policing to, to support rather than taking a criminal approach. But where do you see the, our future going? What do you think is the best direction for us to be going in terms of dealing with this terrible crises we're involved in, in in British Columbia and indeed across Canada. Yeah, yeah. You know, just the, if, if you just take the, the places that you commented, every one of those uh, jurisdictions has their own response. It may touch on what the other one is doing, but ultimately it's a, 
it's a very tailored response to that community. Um, and I'm a big proponent of that. I do believe you really need to listen to the community. You need to listen to the people who actually walk the walk, who have experience with um, substance use. Um, it can't be voices like myself. I mean, I'm, I'm the researcher, I'm the R&D guy, I'm the innovation guy. Um, but I need to be informed by the people who have lived this. Um, that's where we need to get our solutions from. Um, and I also believe it has to be a community response. So whatever we come up with, whatever uh, Health Canada comes up with, or the provincial provinces and territories do, you really have to listen to community. And I think it would be, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us. In fact, it's just that we start with our, our local Indigenous communities, the guidance, the wisdom and experience. Um, has to come from there um, and, and it's not just relating to substance use but for multiple things but they have dealt with challenges um, not necessarily again with substance use but including substance use that we can definitely benefit from and I think if we pay attention to what what our, our indigenous communities are saying if we follow the guidance and then we take that and incorporate it to other communities that are being impacted and really listen to feedback from all these communities, then put it all into the hopper and start developing our solutions. That's gonna have a lot more traction, uptake, and it, that's when you start to see results. Um, you know, I, I, and I talk to people about this, uh, you know, when we're hiring people or we're bringing on practical students that I like to hire um, from within, I like to, bring people up who have had track or have, have a track record of experience. Uh, the reason is because they've now developed these roots and they have this commitment to the work. And so it, it, it shows that passion and it tends to ensure that they're going to have that longevity over time. Um, and that, that's probably common across sectors, but uh, in the innovation tech space, it, it's really important because you know, we're, we're growing, we're expanding all the time and people can move from place to place. So, um, you know, the, I use that analogy to respond to, you know, what, what should be our solution? Because I, I, I think if we lean on the things that have long track or long track record of, of responding to things, to, to a richness of culture and experience, I think that's really where the solutions are gonna come from and they'll stick around the longest. I think the message you have in that is probably a good message for all people who are making decisions at any level of government or any societies. It's it's the end user. It's yeah. how, how do we engage and get the voice of the end user? It seems uh, somewhat autocratic or dictatorial if somehow we're making laws or directions or policies without him consulting them. And uh, hopefully in a free and democratic society that's sensitive and caring, that's something that we we, we should do and could do much better than we do today and yeah. try to engage you and be able to, to work in, in that, that fashion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. We've, I mean, we've, we know the horror stories, we know the history, and we know the contemporary stories too, when there have been these um, regimes or these, these situations where things have been pushed down onto people and this is the response and this is what you're going to have to deal with. In fact, I would argue that that for a long, long time was the, uh, the, the problem with our response to uh, the overdose crisis. It was almost, it was, it was a solution that was created elsewhere, thrown at a community and that community had no say in what, what those solutions were. I do see that changing now and uh, I, I hope that's the path we continue on. Okay, what, what is it about, uh, what, 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 where do you get your energy and your passion for this type of work? What, where do you think that comes from? What keeps you going and energized about, about the kind of things you get involved in and you care about? And, and is there something? Yeah, yeah I, I get asked that from time to time. We have multiple projects on the go. Um, you know, Gordy, I, I, I don't have an answer for that because I think my answer yesterday was, I don't do other things. Uh, and that's probably true. I just, you know, I, I've, I, you know, I don't have time to really um, socialize too much. And I think this is just part of, you know, that, that stage of life that I'm in right now with a young family and um, fairly busy. Um, and also the work that I do on the innovation side of things um, is 
probably 50% of my life. And the other half is that is the nonprofit um, and just making sure everything's humming at the same time. And uh, fortunately for me, they, they tend to co-mingle quite a bit. And some of the initiatives that we push out have a lot of resonance in that side of it. Um, but I think for me, what, what ultimately drives me is that, um, is that, that opportunity to create and develop solutions um, and then put the right people um, on those projects and then watch the magic happen. Um, you know, I, I, I think for me, one of the greatest strengths that I have is knowing where my weaknesses are. And I, I know my weaknesses really, really well. And I know I serve a purpose to a certain extent, but beyond that, I'm, I'm redundant. You don't, you don't want to see me around too much. <laughs> so, um, and I think that really has served me well because that's allowed me uh, to be really good at stewardship, identifying talented people, bringing good people on board. And then that also assures um, the longevity of initiatives and projects. So the pursuit of that really is what drives me. I think it, it's the, the, there's numerous amounts of uh, uh, projects and tasks and challenges that exist that need to be handled and I think um, both at work and on the nonprofit I've created kind of a uh, malleable organization that can respond nimbly to these things um, a good example is food security we had nothing to do with food security pre-pandemic um, I, I probably couldn't even tell you what food security meant it probably meant you know going down to uh, Crescent Beach and, and grabbing a burger or something that's securing food for myself. Um, but, you know, the, the kids that I was working with, um, I knew that they were going to have challenges with food because unfortunately, uh, when I coach, I tend to bring food along with me because, you know, sometimes the kids just were not, were not eating meals. And so, when COVID hit and we had to shut down and school districts had to shut down gymnasiums, I realized that real quick that those kids were also going to have some challenges around food. So what started off as a small innocuous little project to get them food with food cards. Um, I was able to do that for multiple kids and young families. And I realized the need was so huge and I got tapped to provide for other communities. And that just led to a domino effect where uh, our nonprofit started to respond to numerous communities um, and organizations that really were having tough times in early pandemic. Um, and I think we delivered and um, such a good program and we sh we're still doing it to this day um, that you know we were called on to respond to numerous challenges around food security throughout the lower mainland. Um, our work today continues, thankfully, through uh, Peace Arch Hospital Foundation. We're still uh, looked at as one of the organizations that's able to provide food aid relief. Um, and we do it for uh, quite a few number of vulnerable individuals, including seniors throughout South Surrey and White Rock, um, and also families. I mean, one thing that COVID really uh, opened up and showed all of us is that, you know, those stereotypes of who's experiencing challenges it doesn't really hold. I mean, you could just go to a, a food bank and see who's lined up there. They, they don't look too different than you and I. And um, and I always tell people, you know, it's it's only one small crisis that ultimately means that you two are on that lineup. And I think COVID really shone a uh, a light on that for everybody. You mentioned uh, being aware of all your weaknesses uh, and yeah. how helps that. I thought I was aware of all of mine, but it seems every day or so I find another one that I wasn't aware of that I've got to learn and get a better grasp on. Talk a little bit about uh, your wife and working at this yeah. hospital uh, and your family and and how you keep them engaged and uh, the energy yeah. that you get and support from your family. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it, it is tough. It's tough with uh, and I'm probably preaching to the choir because we have you know, a lot of young families around us and a lot of young families in our community here. Um, so keeping young children engaged during COVID has always been a challenge. Um, I think pre-COVID, what I benefited from is that, you know, being 
working in community, especially working with youth and coaching and, and numerous uh, youth uh, directed initiatives, I was able to bring my children along with me. Um, they kind of grew up in that system. They saw uh, what it takes to get uh, a program up and running. I mean, I was literally, <laughs> uh, you know, to get programs up and running, you know, I have numerous basketballs that I'm shoving into the back of an SUV and hauling them out in the middle of winter and they're putting them back in, pylons, sports equipment. So I'm a coach in the literal sense, maybe not a great coach, but in a functional way anyway. So, you know, just getting my uh, kids on it. Hey, it's your turn to put, get the equipment out, your turn to put it away. Um, you know, if I'm coaching, they're there the entire time. And the older guy's taken to it quite a bit. He's, he's picked up, uh, well, I, I won't say he's picked up my skill set because my skill set was, <laughs> it was, I think it was getting fouled out in the fourth quarter after about, you know, most of my time spent on the foul line. So, um, yeah, he, he's picked up with it, but you know, somehow, and you know, you're aware that our frontline nurses and doctors, they were, you know, they were really worked uh, to the bone throughout COVID. So uh, with my wife, uh, we really had to figure out a strategy that would work best for our family. And it was, it wasn't easy. Like many families would know, uh, it was challenging. It continues to be challenging now that case numbers have spiked again, as of, I think it was three weeks ago. Uh, we feel it at the home front quite a bit in terms of how much we can interact with her. Uh, there was a time when we couldn't get we to set up separate, you know, sleeping areas and washrooms. And I was convinced at first that it was just a strategy for her to get away from me, but it turns out, it, you know, it was okay. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was definitely a challenge. It was it was a really tough challenge, and um, but somehow I think through just laughter and, and being family and being close we were able to kind of figure out a strategy that works for um, not only us but the children and really it's it, that's where it matters because kids they don't see the world the way we do they can't rationalize through it the way we do so we really had to hold it down for them if you had a, a message for uh, for our listeners and our watchers uh, people who would be tuning in what might that message be There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of messages, but um, the one thing would be to, you know, really see, try, you know, there's that old cliche of walking uh, in a, uh, the other person's shoes. Um, and I, I really believe that's important. And that's something that you could, you could probably translate to numerous scenarios and, and situations, uh, whether somebody's dealing with uh, food shortages, or they're dealing with substance use in their in their lives or with a loved one um you know or you know someone's working at a hospital or whatever it is i think our communities are served much better when we have compassion and empathy for what we're, the other person is experiencing and that's you know sometimes we get away from that i think we you know we get siloed and it's not anybody's fault i think we are in a you know sometimes in a culture where it's very uh self-focused um but if we can just, you know, pull the lens back a little bit and really see the wider community and have communal understanding and compassion, um, and that, that'll bring a lot of healing and it'll bring us to the solutions we need much, much sooner. Um, and that's something I carry forward. And I mentioned it earlier, our response on um, technology side is very much community based and it comes from that perspective. Um, and uh, I, I remember always there was a, I had a, when I was a firefighter, I had a fire chief and during the uh, ceremony, the graduation ceremony from the JI, he said, uh, look, when you get up there to speak to the rest of the guys in the families, just say, tell them to use their good sense. And I couldn't really, well, you mean common sense, right? And that's, you're saying it wrong. And he looked at me and said, no, no, I'll car. He goes, I have to say good sense because there's nothing common anymore i mean we all bring different perspectives and it's wrong for us to say that now so you know we shouldn't stick to that what we want is we want everyone to exercise and use their good judgment and good sense so that's something that stuck with me and i hopefully that carries forward into my children and uh, our community as wide that's a great message and you're a great role model
for our community and for your family. And thank you so much for being our guest on Community Connections. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful community. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.